Bom, acho que a gente pode começar. Ok, uh, let's get started. I would like to show you the agenda for today. We'll start with an introduction uh, and speaker bios. Then we'll take a deep dive in the registration project for Baru, uh, the Baru Nut. Then we're going to share with you examples and more details on the European regulations that are very similar to the UK regulations as well. So we'll be covering the two topics. And then we'll have the Q&A in which we'll address your questions. The questions you submit via the chat. And if any questions are unanswered, we'll try to get the answers to you as soon as possible and also the reference materials. So my name is Isabel Smith. I am the manager of the Baru Nut Registration Project uh, through Partnerships for Forests, and also the facilitator of this dialogue. I would like to introduce you to our colleagues from Hogan Lovells and Exponent, uh, Jacqueline Maley and Ian Harty. So if you could please share a little bit about your background, Jacqueline and Ian, it would be uh, very helpful. So, I, yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Maria and Isabel, um, hello everybody. Very um, happy to be here and to be talking about novel traditional foods with you and our experience on the Baronaut project. My background is I am a Dutch national, um, have been working in European regulatory affairs with a focus on food for um, more than 25 years um, and uh, look forward to speaking about this subject with you. Anya? Yes, hi everyone. Um, also very happy to present today and our experiences with um, with the Barring Up project. Um, so my name is Anya. I'm from Ireland. I work for a consultancy company called Exponent as a managing scientist. My background is in nutrition and I have a lot of experience in dietary exposure assessments and also in regulatory submissions to the European Union. Maravilha. Obrigada, pessoal. Okay, great. Now I would like to tell you a little bit about the about the scope for the project, uh, the Partnerships for Forests project, explaining uh, the scope and also the why, the reasons for it. So this is a program funded by the British government, and its focus is to catalyze public investments. Uh, for the private sector, public sector, and communities. It operates in Africa and Asia, and it has reached already uh, 1.2 billion in private capital that was mobilized. And this shows how important the program is to unleash uh, sustainable investments. We also have 8.6 million of hectares uh, with sustainable management and also improvements being made, benefiting 300,000 people. So uh, our scope, we work with forest partnerships, which are social and environmental impact mm -hmm. businesses that uh, use land sustainably. So this is one group of activities. Uh, another group of activities is the enabling conditions in which we work at uh, removing critical barriers that stand in the way of sustainable investment. And then we also uh, do projects to drive demand, what we call the demand side. Uh, Baru is part of this group of activities because its goal is to increase demand for Baru and also providing access to new markets. And by the way, just to underscore how important this type of project is, uh, you know, it's it's very difficult to organize a project like this on your own. So or organizations like Partnerships for Forests are here to support you in this process. So, the Cerrado biome, let's say a few words about it. It's a beautiful biome. Uh, it's like the Brazilian savanna. And it's very important both for the Brazilian economy and for nature. It's a crucial area for regulating climate in the country. And it spans 25% of the Brazilian territory. And it also has borders with 
many other biomes. So also something that makes it so important. It's considered one of the world's hotspots, that is one of the richest and most threatened biomes. Currently it's being threatened by the expansion of agriculture and it has lost already 45% of its original vegetation. Several traditional and local communities rely on the Cerrado natural resources to live. And also, uh, economically speaking, it's the source of several resources that are used for industry and markets. Baru is uh, collected in the remaining or the remnants of the Cerrado, and it's harvested by local communities. Now, if you're not familiar with Baru. This is the nut, this is the tree, this is the fruit. It's a Cerrado native plant with a extremely high nutritional value, what we call superfood. So of course, it's something that promotes good health and the, the nut is what we use and you can uh, eat it raw, roasted or processed such as meal, cookies, homers, oils, several, several possibilities. So the Baru production chain is key for the Brazilian social bioeconomy because it's very relevant for the local economy. And as we saw, it covers a, a, wide, a wide area of the Brazilian territory. Depending on location, Baru is called by different names, including Bajuró, Kumaru, and Feijão Coco. So as you can see, it's such a large area that, you know, even regionalisms uh, have developed around this name. So, uh, so uh, one of our objectives in partnerships for forests is to enhance the value chain of forest products and at the same time improve the livelihoods of local communities. There are several ways of addressing uh, this issue, several different responses as well. But in the Baru project, Actually, it was a project that uh, followed another project with, uh, so actually uh, we had this other example in mind and uh, that's why we decided to unleash this market. So uh, Baru has huge potential uh, in terms of trading internationally. If you take a look at the, at the chart on the, on the, the Square, we just give you an idea of the potential. This is uh, Brazilian exports of nuts. The different countries are um, color coded. So you see that orange is uh, the color that appears the most. And you see that, you know, here we have, of course, the representation of European and European countries and the UK. And uh, we know, for example, that the greatest potential for use of Baru lies in Europe and the UK, but also it could also apply to other forest products and other nuts. For example, just to take Germany as an example, which is the large yellow circle. Uh, so we have, you know, uh, a gap between actual use and potential use. And the, the, the gap in the case of Germany represents 13 million dollars. But looking also at the Netherlands and the UK, just in the top three countries, if we add up the market potential, we'll reach 43 million. So 1% of this market is equivalent to 4.3 million in exports, just to give you an idea uh, of the market size. So in developing uh, the project strategy, we focused on uh, unleashing or increasing access to new markets and also valuing standing forests while increasing income of local communities. Several of the local communities are not, are not uh, registered because they 
are from the global south. So registration of Barun nut in the EU and the UK uh, creates market opportunities for this project. And this automatically will create better conditions for standing forests and income generation through uh, cooperatives and uh, small regions or associations of producers in the Cerrado. So this is the registration process in short. We're going to give you a lot more details in the next minutes, but here we can observe that the most important thing initially is to understand the regulation and collect any missing data. Uh, that you're going to use in your submission. And then we realized that at Partnerships for Forests, we lack this, this type of knowledge and know-how. So we uh, we seeked partnerships with Logan Hovels and also Exponent. They have uh, sound legal and scientific knowledge to support us. So... Uh, the next step is preparing the dossier, submitting the dossier. Then there is an approval process that we're going to uh, give you details on. And then we have to monitor and address any responses from the agencies. So now I would like to, uh, to pass the floor to my colleagues so that we can take a deeper look into the regulation and the opportunities for these products. Thank you very much, Isabel, for uh, that extensive uh, background. Um, so I said, yes, um, Partners for Forests approached us about 18 months ago to assist with this project. Um, and um, looking at uh, one of your slides that you presented, Isabel, uh, with all the percentages and the European countries, just by way of background, 27 member states plus the United Kingdom, um, at the moment, so huge market. We have uh, legislation in the area of uh, food that applies directly uh, in all uh, member states, which means that um, if you comply with the European regulation, then you're, you essentially have a market throughout the EU. Uh, to the extent um, that you, the UK pretty much still follows food legislation in the European Union to date. So, uh, and particularly with novel food, um, they're still um, on the same page. Um, so with regard to novel foods legislation, it's been in force in the EU since 1997, um, but um, we have uh, a revised version of this regulation that dates back to 2018. And Anya Harty from Exponent will be going in much more detail about it. But what does it say? It essentially, there was a, a decision to um, have a cut-off point of the 15th of May 1997. Uh, and that was, in fact, the date um, of the previous regulation on novel foods. And it was decided that foods that were not uh, produced or uh, had no history of use in the EU prior to that date would be subject to a novel foods review. And these would be foods originated from plants, animals, uh, you know, minerals, microorganisms, but also foods resulting from production processes that had not been used prior to the 15th of May, 1997. The um, Original regulation in 1997 did not really look into great detail into foods that had a very long history of use outside of the European Union. And this was uh, addressed in the revised regulation of 2018 that uh, Anya will be having a look at. When we were engaged uh, about 18 months ago, we looked at it very much from a, okay, what is the EU regulatory framework that applies and in doing these types of dossiers for clients and organizations that we work with. We work very closely together with Exponent um, and our contacts there. And Anya Harty is a colleague that we've known for a very, very long time. And the two of us have been working on this dossier the past 18 months. Um, and Exponent uh, has been extremely helpful in pulling together the scientific and technical data that goes with the submission of the dossier. So I'm going to pass on the floor to Anya to describe the, the background to um, the regulation that applies. And then after that, we will 
uh, look at it, how it applied specifically to the bar or not. Anya? Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, so I'd like to bring you all through the regulatory approval process for novel foods in the, in the EU. Um, as Jacqueline said, there's a parallel submission process for the UK, um, which does require a separate submission. However, the, the data package and the, the types of information that you need to provide are, are basically the same. So for now, I'll just focus on the, the submission process for the EU. Um, so as Jacqueline um, mentioned, there was a revised regulation on novel foods in, in 2015. And this regulation on novel foods controls um, controls how no, um, all, all the not regulation regarding novel foods and traditional novel foods in, in the EU. So this regulation sets out the centralised authorisation process, which is done um, by an electronic submission process to the European Commission, who then in turn will pass on an application for the risk assessment process to the European Food Safety Authority, who are also known as EFSA. And this regulation on novel foods sets out um, all applicable information, such as information on how um, these are generic authorizations, so they're not specific to the, to the applicant. Um, this regulation also provides details on the categories of novel foods, so you can see where your no novel food or novel food ingredient would fit within the whole regulation. And it also provides background on the union list of authorised novel foods, which was new to this regulation, and which I'll also provide a bit more detail and explain what it looks like um, further on in this presentation. And very importantly, what Jacqueline mentioned, this regulation introduces the concept of a traditional novel food or a traditional food, food from a third country. Um, so just next slide, please. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is a traditional novel food? So a traditional novel food is a food that has um, a, has not been consumed in the, in the EU prior to, to May 1997, but which has a history of use in a third country. And what I mean by a third country is a country outside the European Union. And this history of use must be for at least 25 years. And there must you must be able to provide documentary evidence that this was um, part of the customary diet and was part of the diet of a number of people. So it has to be a part of the, the customary diet of, of this third country. Um, it also importantly must be derived from primary production. That's an important aspect of a traditional novel food. And it does not include any so that the data that you provide on this evidence of, of history of intake, this can't um, be linked to non-food juice. So it has to be evidence of food juice in this third country. Just the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so the approval process, so the actual process of building up your data package and submitting it um, into the EU is, is quite similar to a regular novel food, although it's known as a simplified process and instead of calling an, applic an application, it's referred to generally as a notification. So it's a simple notification to the European Commission for a regulatory authorization of the traditional novel food. Similarly to, to a regular novel food, um, you do need to develop a dossier. So this is will still um, um, entail quite detailed data package that you need to provide to the European Commission. Um, as part of this data package, I'll, I'll give a little bit more information later on, but it, you do very importantly need to um, provide this evidence of the history of consumption. So that is something that the regulatory authorities will, will really look at. Um, there are other data that are required, such as on the composition of the food. So what is the food? You need to be able to define what it is and how it is produced. And to help applicants, there are... Um, the European Food Safety Authority have developed a detailed guidance on what is required in this data package. And it outlines the administrative details and the technical and scientific details. So if you are considering in, in developing a data package for a traditional novel food, I really recommend that you, um, that you would look to this, this guidance. As I mentioned, uh, notifications are for traditional novel foods are done through an electronic submission process. Again, the European Commission have developed detailed guidance on how, on how to set 
yourself up as an applicant and how to, and how to submit the submit the, the data package. Um, and we'll just go to the next slide, please. Okay, so at the beginning, before you even um, start developing your data package in your novel on your traditional novel food, often we are asked how do, how do you know if your food or ingredient is in fact a novel will fall under the, the category of being a novel food. So one, one way to do it is to request a formal opinion from a European member state competent authority. There is a, a formal way on how to do this. It's known as Article 4 consultation request. And we have um, we, um, we have provided a link on, the, on that slide there where you can look at outcomes of other consultation requests on novel foods. So a member, so you would, so the applicant would go to a member state competent authority, and they would provide some background information on the food itself, and that authority would take a couple of months. I think it's up to four months to determine the novel status. So they can either determine that it is novel, and therefore you have to go down through a, a traditional novel food or a full novel food approval process. Or they will determine that it is not not novel that there is a history of use in the European Union. Um, yeah. And on to the next slide, please. Um, okay. And if you if um, if you don't, um, another way to determine the novel status is to consult what is known as the novel food catalogue. So this is a catalogue of many ingredients. And um, there's a lot of botanical and pl plant based food foods and herbal extracts. That the European Commission have have developed and put together over many years, and um, you can access this online and just do simple Google EU novel food catalogue, and and you will get the the search tool up. And um, this has recently been updated, so you um, it provides quite a bit more information on if the substance itself is considered novel or not novel, or um, what part of the the plant, for example, if the leaf or the root. Um, is novel or not novel, and whether that has a history of use in foods or food supplements. So it's quite a very quite a good source of information on novel status of, of many foods and ingredients. Um, okay, so um, obviously we'd like to bring this back to the to our experience with the barrow nut. And um, so barrow nut, nut is considered as a traditional novel food. There is no history in the European Union. Um, prior to May 1997. It is considered a traditional novel food because of the fact it's produced in primary production. And there is a history of use in a third country, which is um, in the Copa Cerrado in, in Brazil and the re that region. So the challenges that we face in, in, in pulling together a data package sufficient to meet the requirements for a traditional food novel food notification or aspects such as gathering information on the traditional um, use of barrow nut in, in Brazil. So as we mentioned before, it's necessary to prove the consumption um, for at least 25 years in the, in the country, of, uh, in the third country. So information that we gathered on barrow nut, for example, where we looked at production volume, um, annual production volume of barrow nut over, over the last number of years. And um, we also did a very detailed literature review um, and we also gathered information such as um, recipes on how barren nut um, has been used, documented use in recipes um, that are a traditional part of the, of the diet in that region. Um, also, another challenge is, is to identify and to and to work with laboratories that can do the analysis for you that is necessary to determine the compositional um, and, um, analysis of the, the novel food. So for example, um, you need to work with a laboratory that can do nutritional analysis, microbiological analysis, and other analysis such as pesticides, dioxins, aflatoxins, for example. Um, it's important that laboratory has validated methods or, accredit or is accredited for that type of analysis. These are the things that the regulatory authority, so that EFSA and the European Commission will look for. Um, another um, challenge or consideration that you need to think about are stability testing. So showing that the traditional novel food is stable under normal conditions of storage when placed on the market in the EU is required. 
So if, for example, you have, um, you know that your product will have a shelf life of 12 to 24 months, you need to provide evidence of that by doing stability testing. So you need to show that the, the, the food stuff is stable in terms of microbiological profile, nutritional profile, and oxidation profile, for example. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that you do that you need to provide um, and build a dossier um, for the notification. So there are a number of aspects, and these are all outlined in, the, in that guidance document that, that I mentioned to you. Um, so you need to provide um, administrative data. So what is the food? Who is the applicant? Who's responsible for submitting and, and liaising with the European Commission on the application? You also need to provide information um, if it has regulatory status as a novel food or food ingredient in any other country outside the EU um, and a cover letter. Um, in terms of the technical data, so you there's quite detailed information that will need to be provided. So the main sections are on identity, the production process, the compositional data that I mentioned, um, specifications of, of this particular novel food. You need to provide information on the experience of continued use, which I also mentioned. So you have to provide the evidence of use for greater than 25 years. Any proposed conditions of use, so how you propose that the novel food will be used, um, any maximum use levels, how it could be integrated into other foodstuffs, for example. Concluding remarks is where you provide a summary of everything. And then also very importantly is your annexes. So any um, comp like so for example, the compositional data, you need to provide all the certificates of analysis from the from the labs and um, any accreditation certificates. So all that detailed information needs to be provided. And also copies of any rev references that are cited throughout the application, they need to be provided. Um, and finally, we just have noted there that a public summary will, will be needs to be submitted. And this public summary, once the application or the notification has been validated by the European Commission, they will post this summary on their website. So you, you know, so not to provide, so only to provide non-confidential information in this summary. Um, okay, so how to go about submitting the notification? So I did outline or describe this a little bit earlier. Um, so this is all done through the electronic submission process. So the applicant or the person who's going to submit the um, application needs to register on a system with the European Commission. Um, and it brings you through um, a system where you, you upload and you add um, all the information, the administrative data and the technical information on the, the traditional novel food. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this slide just provides um, more of an illustrative um, overview of how how the application is 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 submitted and who assesses it and how it is evaluated. So the first stage is the applicant. So this is where you, the applicant, will um, pro, um, compile your data package, upload it, everything into the e-submission portal, which is known as uh, the the e-submission um, food chain um, portal. Um, once you submit, then this goes directly to the European Commission. So the novel food um, unit of the European Commission will review the, the data and they will validate it. So they will check that all the required information has been um, provided with the submission. Um, once they are happy that, they, that they, everything has been submitted correctly, they will then forward the notification to both EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, and to the 27 member states. So following this, the, um, the European Food Safety Authority and the member states will provide any comments and feedback to the European Commission on the notification. If they are happy with everything, if they are satisfied, there are no safety concerns, then the European Commission will move to authorise the novel food. However, if ESSA or if any of the member states have any safety objections, the European Commission will consider those and they may not be able to authorise the traditional novel food. And at that stage, the applicant can will have to um, decide to move forward with a full novel food approval or else they can, 
they cannot move forward with, with, with the traditional novel food application. Um, I just want to say that the timelines that we have put there, these are indicative. So in general, the European Commission will take up to one month to forward the, the notification once um, to do the validity check and forward the notification. However, if they have questions, so if there are certain pieces of information that have not been provided as part of the notification, then they will request that the applicant, um, they will go back to the applicant and request they provide those and they will um, stop the clock as such. So they will, they will take more time than this one month. Um, and similarly, when EFSA and the member states are reviewing or doing the risk assessment, they may also require additional information to perform this assessment and they will go back to the applicant through the European Commission to request this information. And again, the clock will be stopped while the applicant gathers that information and submits it um, back to through the e-submission portal. So this, um, yeah, so these time periods are really just indicative and, and generally our experiences, this will take a lot longer than, than what we have there. Um, so just the next slide. So once, um, once the European Commission is satisfied there are no safety objections, they will move to authorise the novel food. So this is when they, they draw up what is known as an implementing regulation. So when they, they, so this implementing regulation will be specific for this novel food or traditional novel food. And this will move to formally update the what is known as the union list of novel foods. So the union list is a list of all novel foods that have been approved and authorized in the European Union. And the union list sets out the approval and conditions and, la and any labeling requirements for that novel food. And it will also outline the specifications for placing that novel food on the market in the EU. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, I think actually I summarized this. So this is just what the union list is. So this is also a very useful resource to, to have a look at, at what other novel foods look like, what the conditions of use are, any labeling requirements, and as I said, the specifications. So a novel food can only be placed in the market in the year in the EU if it fulfills both the conditions of use and the specifications for that novel food. Um, so the next slide. So I think, yeah, so this is an example of what the union list looks like. So I decided to take an example of a similar food stuff to, to Barry Nut. So this is an approved traditional novel food, which is dried nuts um, from, from Canary. Um, so this is the table one. So this outlines any conditions for use. So there were no specific conditions of use for canary nut. However, there are some labeling requirements um, which outlines how this ingredient is to be label, labeled. And also um, there is specific labeling regarding um, potential aller allergy to, to um, canary nut. So when placed on the market in any food stuff, these conditions have to be met. met. And the next slide is um, this is just to show you again what the spec, what we mean by specifications for a novel food. So for canary nut, it can only be placed on the market if it meets all of these specifications. And these would have been agreed with, um, agreed with the applicant at the time of submission. So they need to provide specifications in the composition. So um, for example, ash, moisture, protein, carbohydrate, fat, fiber. Also, other aspects such as microbiology, and um, we have here for this specific example, we have specifications for aflatoxins and heavy metals and also dioxins. Um, yeah, so that was just an example of what the union list looks like. Okay, so finally, just to, 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 to end the, the regulatory piece as such, it's important to be aware of the, the EU, trans, what is known as the EU Transparency Regulation. So this came into force on the 27th of March, 2021. And this introduces um, specific requirements in relation to transparency. And the aim of, of this regulation was to increase transparency of risk assessments in the food chain in the, in the EU. And a very important aspect of this to be aware of is that if you are planning on submitting a notification for a traditional novel food, any studies, um, and what I mean by a study is like a stability study or an efficacy study or a safety study. 
So if you're planning any of those type of studies for a regulated product approval, such as novel food in the European Union, you need to pre-notify that study with EFSA. And there is a process to do that. And again, EFSA have submitted guidance on how to do that. But that is a very it is now is a very important part of, of the submission and planning process for any novel food authorization or any novel food approval. So I think that's my last slide. So I'll move, I'll pass it back to, to Jacqueline. Yes, thank you, Anya. I'll um, I realize we have 20 minutes left, so I will keep my uh, my uh, additional slides um, presentation. I'll try and keep it short because I see there are a few questions and be interesting to have a discussion on those. But this is just to give you uh, as participants in this um, webinar an idea of the timeline that was involved on the Baronot uh, application specifically. So you'll see on the left. Um, all the work that was done prior to us being engaged in August 2022. Um, and uh, after having established that, it would be worth uh, pursuing the Baronaut registration in the EU. Uh, Partners for Forests approached us and we approached Exponent to work with us on this. And as Anya uh, referred to, um, a very detailed gap analysis is the first step, like what data do we have? What data do we dispose of? What data do we need to gather to start building this dossier? Uh, obviously, focusing on history of consumption, which needed to be more than 25 years. Uh, in our case, um, uh, we had 21 years, I think. Um, we probably have a, a few more years now, but scientific papers, books, supply and information from companies. Um, we went everywhere, not just in Brazil, but also outside Brazil to see if we could find studies uh, undertaken elsewhere. We also coordinated through contacts and partners for forests with the Ministry of Agriculture in Brazil to inquire whether maybe they disposed of um, data that would show support for the bar not having been consumed for many, many more years than just the 25 years. So that whole exercise took quite a little, quite a bit of time. We knew at the time that the bar nuts had already been approved uh, and authorized in Switzerland. So there was an exercise to try and determine who had registered there and what data had been submitted, which um, proved a little difficult in the beginning. And, um, you know, as time went by, we were successful in obtaining further, further information on that. And why was that relevant? Because although Switzerland is not a, a member of the European Union, um, and there is a trade agreement between Switzerland and the EU, whereby they have agreed to... Um, except to some degree or look more lenient in a more lenient way at one another's uh, food safety risk assessments and approval processes for food products. Um, so being able to refer to this not having been approved in Switzerland and providing the data to the EU authorities that had been submitted to the Swiss authorities would significantly increase the chances of success for the Baronat dossier. Um, so you'll see that for the better part of six to seven months, we worked very hard on developing the notification dossier, which went in in March uh, last year. Um, and um, it really helped that we had through Exponent um, also very good contacts with um, the commission um, uh, expert in charge of this, the head of unit. Uh, whom uh, I actually on a separate dossier also got to know afterwards. So having the personal contacts with the people in the commission was also very useful in this dossier as part of the application, just to kind of give them a call and say, hey, this is coming, uh, this is the background, please let us know. The validity check <clears throat> that was referred to by Anya uh, started in March last year and pretty soon after, uh, and in a way, surprisingly, because um, in relation to traditional novel foods, it's not always customary to get questions back. Usually, um, on uh, if you do not meet the validity check, the, the commission, according to the legislation, has every right to pass on to responding to the applicant saying, OK, you did not pass the validity check. 
um, do you want to withdraw or do you want to go for a full novel food application? In our case, the commission came back with questions um, and uh, it showed um, a willingness to really consider uh, a possibility for Baronaut to come to the European market. They asked additional questions primarily in relation to compositional analysis and shelf life stability data, which um, they um, needed uh, additional evidence on longer than the period that was provided for. Um, in the meantime, uh, so we worked on, on that data. We carried out through uh, engaging a laboratory um, additional analyses on the composition um, and aflatoxins uh, was one of, one of the areas of concern. Um, and uh, we managed to um, also work together with another um, producer who was able to provide data. In fact, it was the producer that had originally um, uh, been involved in, in Switzerland. So we were able to, to get some really useful data into, um, into the dossier. And if we go to the next slide, You'll see that in um, September, I already referred to that, the lab was engaged. Uh, yes, it was very important that prior to engaging the labs, we did a verification of the methodologies used by these labs to carry out these additional tests. Um, we had ongoing engagement with other producers and uh, we kept very close contact with the Commission and explained that we uh, had understood the additional questions, were working hard on providing the additional information that they required, and informed them that we would report back um, before the end of the year, uh, which was 2023. And in December, we, we told them the information is forthcoming in January. So we kept in close contact with them in terms of, you know, what to expect and when. And that proved really, really helpful. So um, in January, then we reviewed the additional data that was generated from the additional testing carried out, compositional analysis and shelf life study, and uh, completed with help of exponent the um the um, Baronaut dossier and also were able to provide additional information in there to the Swiss data that we had been able to, um, to, obtain, to obtain. So the dossier has just been submitted last week uh, and this week to both the EU um, authorities as well as the UK FSA, we uh, Food Standards Authority Agency, I should say. And uh, we have gotten word back from um, the European Union uh, that EFSA suitability check deadline has been set for the 9th of April. Uh, so that's when all going well, the four month review period by member states and EFSA will start. Uh, and as Anya explained, either they have reasoned objections or they do not. So we hope um, that we um, have passed the test this time. So best case scenario, uh, the Baronaut uh, is authorized hopefully shortly after the, after the summer. Um, and um, I think uh, I have already discussed the next slide and pretty much the slide thereafter. So I'd like to go to the last slide, which is tips for successful notification. As mentioned, it really helps to be in close contact with the authorities and to keep them abreast of where things are at. So keep the communication going is, is one advice that we would give you to respond quickly to questions that they have. And also to make sure that you have, it's not on here, but it's very important to be able to uh, you know, uh, make sure that you have uh, language capabilities to respond quickly. So put somebody in charge who speaks English, um, that really helps. Um, it is okay to ask for extensions of deadlines if you can provide a good reasoning and argumentation as to why more time is needed. Uh, obviously, the studies need to be done in accordance with validated methods. Um, uh, and all submit all the data that is available. And obviously, you know, engaging external expertise can help um, move things quicker and may save time and money. But as Anya said, even though five months is what is referred to in the legislation, um, as you can see, we started in August 2022. It's now February 2024. By the time it comes through, it's 
September, it probably, we probably could have saved time had certain tests been carried out in advance of submitting uh, the dossier. Um, but these are all, you know, it's always easy to, to judge on this, go, you know, afterwards. But I think, um, um, it's looking really good. And I think there's a real willingness on the EU with all the efforts undertaken to, um, you look in a very positive way at the dossier this time around. So I'll end there, realizing we have 10 minutes left, Isabel. <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ania. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you all for attending. Uh, so now I would like to ask you to write your question on uh, the chat. We have uh, many, many questions. I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them, but we'll be sending this material to you uh, in Portuguese and in English for everyone who registered. And I, I, I just wish to let you know that we'll be writing uh, case studies and uh, they'll be available in three languages, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And we'll try to incorporate your questions to the materials, okay? So I think we may start now, shall we? Let me, let me choose a question. Okay, what's the difference uh, if you, Choose another country in the EU, for example, if you decide to register your product in Portugal. I can. Would you like me to answer? Oh, por favor, Anya. Yeah. Um, okay. So in um, so with the uh, novel food process, it's a centralized, it's a central authorization process. So all submission applications have to go through the European Commission. So you don't submit to a, a member state. So the first thing is you submit your application to the European Commission through the electronic submission portal. And then the European Commission, once they validate your application, will send it to EFSA and to the individual member state competent authorities. So, um, yeah, and once authorized, once um, the traditional food has gone through the whole process and it's authorized, then it's authorized for sale to be placed in the market in all EU member states. Hope that addresses that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially, you have you have a a, a twenty seven member state market, right? If you're approved mm -hmm. in the EU, um, you know you come in through Portugal, provided you have you you meet. You know, I think this is important. I mean, this is a novel foods regulation, and obviously, registration authorization is key. But please not, do not forget that there's a whole raft of other legislation that you will also need to consider when placing the product on the market from a quality point of view, but also from a labeling point of view, a packaging point of view. But provided all those conditions are met, then you have a 27 member state market to your disposition. We have a few more questions. Uh, uh that you know okay so now uh you know how can we tap into these markets now that you know uh we were able to submit the application okay so we're still in the application process for borrowing up so we have to wait until a decision is made by the european commission so we've got to, the risk assessment has to be completed by efsa and the member states, and then the commission has to make a decision. And if they decide that it they they want to author or it's it's they're going to authorize it, um, then a, a regulation will be drafted to update the union list. And only at that stage can you place the product on the market. So we're still yeah. in the middle of the application process. Yeah, and once that authorization comes through, it'll come with specifications as to what the bottle nut um, must comply with in order to be eligible for placing it on the market in the EU. Um, the application, Anya, correct me if I'm wrong, is for roasted bottle nuts, uh, not for processed bottle nuts. So they can come in uh, not roasted or roasted, but um, at point of entry into the EU, they may still be roasted, but prior to being placed on the market officially. 
I think that's important. And in terms of how others can benefit from this generic authorization is by making sure that the Baru nuts that they wish to export to the EU meet the same specifications. And as I mentioned, uh, provided yet you have carried out a full review of the other food law related issues, such as labeling and packaging that are required for placing it on the market. And I presume that you would then either go directly as an, a trader with the EU or you would engage with a specialist importer or somebody who could pack the product for you upon arrival in the EU, um, as I think is the case for, um, well, that's the case, for example, in Switzerland. That's how it works. It's somebody there who imports it and packs it and distributes it to retailers. Ricardo. Okay, we have a, a, another practical question that I'll, you know, I'll begin giving the answer and please Jacqueline and Anya uh, compliment. So I am a small producer in Colombia and Brazil, and I want to start exporting some products, uh, you know, a superfood or something that can be used in cosmetic applications. So uh, how to get started? Because it seems so complicated, such a lengthy product process uh, and also very expensive and time consuming. So it's not a simple process, but at any rate, uh, you know, I, I, there is this motivation. We want to really tap into those markets and at the same time protect our biodiversity. So, you know, uh, through international projects and also partnerships uh, with organizations like Partnerships for Forests, if you have a good project, you might get support. Uh, it could be something that, uh, you know, seems very removed from the realities of small cooperatives or, you know, going uh, your way alone. But if it's a good project, you can find support. You can find funding uh, either through green finance or uh, an international cooperation uh, project. I think that the, the key message here is looking for uh, international partners. But if you can give us also some information, Jacqueline and Anne, about you know, the expenses and uh, how to go about this process, it would be great. Thank you. I think, um, um, am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. I think, uh, yes, I think you answered the question uh, to great part, Isabel. Um, I, I would also recommend that you engage with your uh, local, uh, local or government authorities, if you like, to see how they can maybe help raise some of these issues in bilateral negotiations with the EU, for example, with uh, to emphasize uh, you know, the issues uh, that you raise. Uh, and obviously, if you can find, since it's a generic authorization process, right, you have no benefit in, you know, going it alone. Um, you, I, I think in our particular case, there was funding, which was great. That helped uh, the applicant enormously. But I think if you uh, can pull together with others uh, who are similarly affected, other producers, you know, then you can share costs in going to the market and, and supporting this dossier. So that would be, I think, one of my recommendations. Okay, we have time for one more question. A question here. If it's an ingredient used in another product, for example, we are registering uh, the Baru nut. What if I want to export the oil? Is the registration open uh, and applicable to everybody? So I'll answer yes. Once you register uh, uh, the Baru nut, everybody can, uh, you know, use this process. But if you can give us, you know, uh, the information about, you know, processing and when it's industrialized, how does it work? Thank you. Uh, well, I start on, yeah, and you follow up because I'll keep short. But in, in my view, it becomes a more complicated if you're talking about, depending on 
you know, what proof there may be of the oil, you know, the process type products. Has that been around forever and ever? Or is that, you know, a recent uh, process, new, you know, a relative, a relevant, relatively new process that has been applied to the baronaut? We were looking at the raw baronaut. Uh, which obviously has been around and has been consumed for a very, very long time. If you start thinking about or considering other types of processes, we will need to see what the evidence would be to support that it would be traditional in the sense of more than 25 years of use, right? Anya? Yes, so this, um, our application is for the roasted barley nut um, um, and, the, and that will be set into the union list once authorised. The definition will be roasted barrel nut. So any derivatives such as the oil, as Jacqueline said, then you would need to consider if there's a traditional history of use and likely it would be a separate notification. So, yeah, I hope that I explain or answers that question. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, Anya, and Maria Eugenia in the translation. Thank you for all of you who participated. I hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll get in touch to you to send you the recording and also answer your questions. And soon we'll see you again. Thank you very much.